Okay, uh, greetings from New York. I guess uh, it's good morning here and good evening uh, there. Uh, it's really encouraging to see uh, so many of you interested in your careers. Uh, and I want to recognize the uh, Brandix uh, folks uh, for arranging this. Uh, I love your title, uh, Believe, Lead, Empower. It's so relevant for today. Uh, as I was thinking of the type of advice uh, I could give you based on my uh, 40 years of uh, corporate life in the US, I find that what I say today is quite different to what I would have said five years ago. But it is going to be the same no matter, no matter where I speak around the world. Uh, there are two reasons for this. The world is much more connected and interdependent today. You don't have to look very far. The COVID crisis spread all over the world in next to no time. Uh, we have this global supply chain uh, built up from all parts of the world where companies need to look for the best of the best around the world to make products that are better, faster, and cheaper. And second, technology has enabled you to work from anywhere. What's great about this is that jobs will move to where superior skill sets reside. So we are really competing globally. Uh, so these are very exciting times. You will need to look beyond your boundaries uh, and understand what is happening around the world uh, if you are to compete in what is truly a, a flat and global world. So to set the, set the stage, let me uh, give you a little bit of background myself after completing my chartered accountants in Sri Lanka and CMA exams. I left for the US in 1977 to do an MBA. Now, that was a long time ago. Uh, after my MBA, I worked for Ernst & Young in New York City and then joined American Express. And I was the only South Asian. At that time, there weren't too many South Asians working for large corporations in New York City. And that was 1982. Uh, all this made me quite conscious of my identity because I stood out and how I was perceived. I felt like an outsider and sort of an underdog in many ways. And I was thinking this could be quite relevant, relevant to us as we start competing uh, in a global arena where people have more exposure than we do in Sri Lanka. So I'd like to first share with you a little bit of my journey with American Express. I was there with them for 32 years. Uh, talk about how I embarked on this journey as sort of an outsider and how I had to carve out my existence uh, to you know, play with the big boys in the big league. Then I want to really focus my presentation on three critical areas for you. And I'd like to think through it with you. The first is to understand who you are. In other words, how are you described by others? The second is ask, where are you going? In other words, how are you growing? And third is, how will, you look, how will you look back at your life? And in other words, at the end of the day, what would success look like? So here we go, who you are, where are you going? And how will you look back at your life? You know, the first thing that struck me when I joined American Express was the presence or the shadow of this American Express brand. You know, everything we did in the company, we did with the purpose of becoming the world's most respected service brand. It didn't matter whether we were in finance or HR, we were the faces of the brand. And it got me thinking about brands and how powerful, successful brands are. You know, Warren Buffett owns 14%. He's one of the richest men in the world owns 14% of American Express and 10% of Coca-Cola. He said something very interesting. He said, strong brands create a protective moat around the business. In other words, it insulates you and gives you an amazing halo effect. Let me explain. Uh, American Express has what they call this price earnings ratio for those who are in finance. It has a PE ratio of 39. 
which means that for every dollar per share they make, they get, they get a 39 times multiple in their share price. But for its competition, it's only 15 to 20. So for that same dollar that the competition makes, their share price goes up only 15 to 20 times. And I really understood that this is all because of the brand. You know, I remember this in school when, when I used to say something to the teacher, the teacher really didn't pay much attention. But when someone else said that same thing, the teacher would say, hey, that's a great idea. Clearly, that someone else had a better brand than me. So what's in a great brand? You know, a common characteristic of great brands is that they own a unique word to describe them. You think of Apple, right? It's, it's innovation. Uh, BMW, it's uh, performance. Uh, Federal Express, it's overnight. And your previous speaker, Kumar Sangakkara, excellence. Now, these people and companies made their mark by being unique in some form or the other. Uh, in business, we call this differentiating our value proposition. In other words, what do you do better than anyone else? And how do you protect that lead and keep getting better and better? So I started thinking to myself, okay, as this Sri Lankan in New York City, how do I differentiate myself? What comes to people's minds when their name Priyan Fernando is mentioned? You know, in, in a hyper-competitive environment, which is what you are going to face, you cannot rest on your qualifications, MBAs, CPAs, ACAs, and things like that. Every year, performance is reset to zero. And you have to bring in unique value to reinforce your worth to the company. Well, to forward my career, let me tell you, my brand was not about individual excellence. There were better finance, better marketing folks than me. But it was clearly my ability to rally people together, inspire them and lead them to do things that they had never done before. So because of that, I became a student of leadership and I took every opportunity to learn more and more about leadership. So let me share with you three of my experiences and then I'll get into the core of it. Uh, in the early 1990s, I had the privilege of pioneering a concept of, called financial shared servicing. We brought all finance work of, of American Express from 50 countries around the world to just two locations. This was in the early 90s one in India and the other in Arizona. It had never been done before and the people in New York City thought we were crazy. I learned that if we dream big, have the right people, make the right people decisions, motivate them and lead them, the sky is the limit. Today, I can tell you, we have over 7,000 employees working for American Express in Gurgaon, India. And all of the accounting around the world is done in this one location. Imagine, for all of American Express worldwide. Now this, the company recognized that although I was not the most technical guy, I had strong leadership skills and they promoted me to chief financial officer of uh, global corporate business. Uh, in 2001, after the tragic events of 9-11, there was great fear and paralysis around the country. People were not flying you know, on business or on pleasure. Airports were closed. And I was then the president and chief operating officer of the travel business. And we had all these people doing nothing and we had zero revenue and our earnings were going to fall. This meant that the market was going to have a surprise and markets don't like surprises. They have a sense of what a company's profit would be. And if you deviate from that, you're in for trouble. It's not very forgiving. So we didn't have much time. We had to think on our feet and be creative and be prepared to change. So we completely changed how we service our customers and focused on a new line of business, which was our advisory line of business. I won't go into detail on that, but my point here is that that business today is thriving. My point here is that when crises hit us, like we've seen with COVID, uh, there is no point worrying about what we cannot control. Instead, we need to use the current situation 
and the crisis to reinvent ourselves and come out stronger. See, some great things have happened during this crisis. Think Zoom. I mean, we wouldn't have had this uh, ability to communicate, uh, let's say, a year ago. And I must say that I'm so impressed with the team at Brandix. We went through a very tough time during the crisis. And I can honestly say that we are coming out of this crisis a much stronger company today, thanks to the approach and the leadership of Ashraf Omar and the approach taken by our leadership. My final experience that I'd like to share with you was in global financial, after the global financial crisis in 2009, the confidence in banks was destroyed and we were hurting. And I was asked by the chairman to lead a, a worldwide transformation because customers and shareholders look at ourselves and were relying on us. And we had kind of betrayed their trust because of the crisis. So we had to look at ourselves from the lens of the customer. And that required massive changes in the organization. It didn't matter whether we're in finance or in HR. The customer wanted his product, wanted it right and fast. So we had to organize around that. And that has become now a trend and it is being used by that whole approach of looking at a company horizontally is being look, uh, used by so many companies around the world. So my, my learning from that again, right, is that we sometimes get caught up by looking at ourselves internally too much and forget about the fact that we are servicing a customer and servicing others, that we need to look at ourselves outside in as well. And when you look at yourself outside in, you might see a completely different picture like we saw at American Express. Anyway, those are the three examples I wanted to give you. I'd like to go back to this brand and I like to think of myself or my brand as someone who drives transformation and change and inspires people to do more than they ever imagined. So I have been since then continually learning and trying to transform, my, transform myself to stay ahead of the curve. So that's me. So let me ask you, how about you? So as I said before, I was a student of leadership and I learned a lot by reading, attending seminars like this, and more importantly, observing leaders that I admire. Having observed so many great leaders, I saw four common traits which I used as a benchmark to really get to know myself and to take stock of who I am. So let me tell you about those four and I'm going to talk a little bit about each of them. First, these leaders are anchored to a sense of purpose. Second, they are optimistic about that purpose and they're always thinking about it. Third, effective leaders are driven and they deliver results. And finally, they are trusted. So let me talk a little bit about sense of purpose, optimism, results, and trust, okay? Well, these guys, they know where they are going. They have what they call the elevator pitch. Before you get on the next floor, they can tell you exactly where they are going in life. They can explain where they're taking themselves and their teams. And as I used to go around the world uh, and I used to talk to some of my folks, I would know, I could spot these guys and I would think to myself, these are my future leaders. They say, uh, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Uh, and it's sad that I see, especially in Sri Lanka, many naturally gifted, talented people who are just surviving on their talent and floating around without aim or purpose. So that's the first thing, purpose. The second is optimism. You know, their outlook and positive energy inspires colleagues and people around them. Who wants to follow a pessimist, right? I work today as a senior advisor at Boston Consulting Group, and I work with some really smart young professionals. What inspires me is their excitement and optimism about the future, because there are so many possibilities and opportunities that the future holds for them. On the other hand, I have seen some leaders, some who are about a little younger than me, but, but closer to my age, in different companies 
who take a different view. They have reacted very differently to this COVID crisis. There are those who are trying to play it safe. You know, in the old days, they used to call them the Tattu cases. Uh, I don't know whether they still use that phrase, but they were playing not to lose. Whereas there are others who are reinventing themselves by playing to win. They say attack is the best form of defense. We often come across colleagues who are, you know, pretty negative. COVID gives them enough ammunition to be to be negative, right? It's but it is optimism that you need at this time to inspire your families, your friends, and your colleagues. They say a tri- crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So let me ask you: Have you used this time, this time of lockdown, to come out better? You know, our culture at Brandix is to inspire, inspire each other, inspire each other to be the best that we can be. You know, this culture gives me a hell of a lift. Each time I come to Sri Lanka and I visit our offices and our factories, I get lifted by this culture of inspired employees. You need to be a light in inspiring others. The third attribute uh, that got me to ask myself as to who I am is about being results driven. You know, these leaders have the skills and the discipline to get things done. It requires holding people accountable, and there's a way to hold people accountable. You have to plan, you have to do, you have to measure, and you have to provide feedback on those measures, and then come back to see whether you can improve. You know, Einstein defied insanity as doing the same thing the same way all the time, expecting a different result. So let me ask you, what are those things that you continue to do? Have you got better and better? with every repetition or are you doing it the same way without any improvement? Finally, trust. Trust or integrity. Uh, A leader could have great vision, they could have great optimism and could get things done. But if he or she is not trusted, it is a matter matter of time before he loses his credibility. So what is trust or integrity in the corporate world? I'm not talking about immorality and dishonesty. There's zero tolerance uh, for that type of thing in the corporate world. I'm talking about gaining trust with your teams. In the workplace, I would say trust is about two things. Number one, keeping a promise. And number two, keeping your confidences. You know, can your word be relied upon? to do what you promise to do and do it on time. This is sort of table stakes in the corporate world. When you promise to do something, it's expected to be done on time. And second, can you be trusted with confidentiality of the information that you both see and hear? Especially in a work from home environment, it becomes all the more relevant. So to summarize, My definition of leadership is about a sense of purpose, it's optimism, results, and trust. So think about that as you ask yourself who you are. You know, uh, Warren Bennis and John Cotter were two great uh, leaders, uh, people who wrote about leadership. And they said, leaders are not born, they are made. They said, before we can lead, we must start by leading ourselves. And it is not easy, it's hard work. And it continues for as long as you live. So how does one start the journey? Well, set a plan. Where are you going? Or in other words, how are you growing? You know, when you study those people who have excelled, like the previous speaker, it is not talent that just brought you there. It is about hard work. It is about building good habits. You know, great athletes build routines and rituals both on the field and off the field. Remember, off the field as well. So I asked myself, what are my off work routines? Just like going to the nets for batting practice, life skills need practice too. And then I asked, what are my rituals at work? Do they enhance my focus and presence to give 100% all the time? You know, the thing about great people is that they are consistent. 
they are hundred percent all the time. Federer and all the big names, they win all the time. How do they do that? Similarly, for us, we need to make sure that we are hundred percent. Our presence is there all the time. When my colleagues talk to me, I want to make sure that they leave my conversation inspired and convinced that I gave them hundred percent. I don't want them saying, "Hey, he didn't listen to me. He was talking all the time. Didn't give me a chance to talk." Your know, great leaders treat every employee. or customer like they were the only one they had so to prepare my routines of the field i developed habits five habits actually that i'd like to share with you so these are the five it's the pursuit of knowledge it's the pursuit of skills relationships your track record and your reputation right knowledge skills relationship track record and reputation so let's start with knowledge you know effective leaders are incredibly curious they use every opportunity to learn now let's face it our education system simply does not prepare us you know uh for the business world uh to compete globally you will need to have uh, a parallel learning path or you will be left behind you know your a level results four a's or whatever it is is not going to be in a hell of beans uh, in the corporate world so when i started in business school i learned that good leaders were voracious readers uh, because of their desire to learn and upskill and be informed so let me ask you what are you reading today are you on top of what's happening around the world with its uh, politics economics social trends are you an are you an advocate for global gender equality and diversity are you an advocate for protecting our environment the knowledge on these topics are absolutely essential second skills you know about 20 years ago uh, the management guru tom peters said that the pace of change requires reskilling every 18 months i wonder what he would say today uh the question i have is are you taking risks to expand your core set of skills you know the thinking of being an accountant or an hr person or a marketing person may not be that relevant anymore and i, and I say may not be because unlike my experience you will be changing jobs frequently forget about being with one company for 32 years like i did and with these job changes we'll have to acquire new skills for each new job and these were skills that were not taught to you in school you will have to learn on the job for example the world is going digital so to succeed in any job you will need to be part of the digital revolution and have the skills whether it is developing apps or bots using tools like automation and ebay blue prism being able to manipulate big data with tools like hadoop and being able to present that data with visualization tools like tableau these will become standard in your repertoire in the business world uh, i also have an accountant by training i ended up doing so many different jobs that gave me a broad exposure to be a general manager and my advice here would be broaden your horizons so the third area is relationships you know sri lankans are are very very strong at uh, building uh, tight relationships but the question i have is are we using these relationships at least some of them strategically are we continuing to uh, enhance our sphere of influence are we Oh, are we networking with the same old people in the same old places telling the same old stories and jokes you know it's important that you step out of your comfort zone and uh, interact with scientists artists religious leaders philosophers because this expands your mind and your sphere of influence and that in turn translates to creativity and innovation the fourth area of development so i have gone through knowledge skills and relationships is the track record 
Question I have is, are we tracking our growth? Uh, my test is to ask myself if I can add another bullet to my resume every six months. I think it was uh, Plato who said, uh, an unexamined life is not worth living. So the question I have is, do you establish goals? You know, I prefer smart goals. I don't know whether you've heard of it. Goals need to be specific. They need to be measurable. They need to be achievable. They need to be relevant. And they need to be time-bound. Very specific. Give it a time frame. And then create a self-management process where you reward yourself. Yourself when you achieve small successes. This is a journey. And it's nice to have pit stops where you reward yourself. And finally, your reputation or your brand at work or at school. The question I have to ask is, are you truly who you think you are? To do this, you really need to have a best friend or friends who will tell you the truth on how you are perceived. Too often, leaders get blindsided. They are the last to know that what everyone is telling each other about them. It's absolutely critical to have your ear to the ground. And like iron sharpens iron, you need to surround yourself with those types of friends and colleagues who will be honest with you and tell you how you are perceived because they say perception is reality. So, this, so these are the five attributes that uh, I check against. And lastly, I would like to say, how would you look back at your life, right? We talked about who you are, where you're going, and now how will you look back at your life? I must caution you that there are people who have done really well, come to the top of the corporate ladder, followed all the routines that I talked about, only to have a mighty fall. You know, too often this fall is not because of uh, failures of strategy or of execution. It is most often failures in character. You know, the business world is, is very seductive. You get big salaries, you get a nice office, you get perks, you get business trips, restaurants, and the whole works. And it is so easy to get seduced unless you stay firmly on track with what you're grounded. And to focus on what, on to focus on what's what's most important to you. You know, my father used to tell me long ago uh, that it does not matter what you are. What matters is who you are, who you are to your family, to your friends, colleagues, and to society. So to finish well, one needs to be fully aligned. There is no escaping the fact that there are three dimensions to your life. You have the personal you have the professional, and you have the spiritual. These are like, you know, three legs of a stool. If one leg is uh, short or weak, uh, you're in for a rocky ride. And I have seen this derail people over and over again in my 40 years in this country. Now, there are many times in, in, in your life when one leg will be out of sync. For example, when you were sitting for your A-levels, you probably were studying all the time. But you need to be aware of that and make sure that at the right time, you bring back that balance. You know, too often, the ability to reflect on who you are against a spiritual standard, regardless of what your faith is, right, which comes from your parents, is so critical to prevent you being misled and deviated by the trappings of the corporate world and society. I would like to repeat that many times over if I had the time. But you need to have that very strong foundation of a spiritual belief that directs everything you do. You know, Walt Disney said, the more you like yourself, the less you are like anyone else. So you really need, don't need to suck up to people. You don't need to imitate anyone. You were made for a purpose and a beautiful life. So let me end by telling you a story. And I think I've asked the folks to put up a slide here to illustrate my story. Uh, it is, uh, is it coming up? Uh, yes, Priyan, it's coming up. Okay. So this, this slide is really about this uh, beautiful sculpture of David. 
You probably have heard about it, read about it, and some seen it too. It was created by this famed artist, Michelangelo. So when Michelangelo was asked, what inspired him to take a shapeless block of marble and create this beautiful sculpture? This is what he said. You know, when I looked at that block of marble, I saw David in it. Everything that was not David, I chiseled away until the beautiful David emerged. So let me ask you, have you seen that beautiful David in you? And are you chipping away at everything that is not that David in you? Let me tell you, if you do, the best is yet ahead of you. Sri Lankans have a huge advantage in our ability to influence people because we're an island, we uh, know each other well, we get feedback, we live sort of very close to each other. So we are very comfortable in our own skin. And if we can be more ourselves, we become extremely attractive to others because we are very compassionate, caring, warm, right? right? So the key to this is to truly be yourself and it's sort of feeds what I have been talking about, your beautiful self, let it come out. Wherever you are, don't go to ape the West or ape someone else or imitate others. Just be yourself because you are made for a purpose. So, I mean, a lot of it is uh, will and skill, right? Uh, the first is to have the right will because you understand what you can help and what you cannot help. Like I said, don't worry about what you cannot control. What you can control, be extremely optimistic and play to win. You play to win. And then when you play to win, you will develop the skills that help you win. So having a plan, being really precise about the plan, Doing a, working against that plan, measuring your uh, achievement against the plan, then giving feedback. I mean, there are times when team members are not carrying their weight and it was not fair by the other team members if I, as the leader, didn't change that team leader. So be brutally honest with the metrics and then take the action. And then this is a close, uh, close loop and it keeps coming back. Plan, do, measure, feedback, improve. And then little by little, you find that big barriers are being overcome. Well, first, I don't think you can imagine without knowledge. They might call you what they say, pissa, right? <laughs> so I think you need to have knowledge to guide your imagination. And the more knowledge you have, if you use it with the right mindset, the more you can imagine. So I, I learned a lot talking to you know, people who are outside my field. I mean, if you think about uh, uh, Steve Jobs, he spent a lot of time with artists, uh, designers. He was a techie guy, but he spent more time with design folks and artists and philosophers uh, to, for him to imagine what was important. He didn't ask people if they wanted uh, uh, you know, the, the, the cell phone. He just imagined how it would be for a person if he had all this capability at his fingertips. So I think, you know, imagination has to be founded on knowledge, but not restricted by knowledge. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's very different today. I mean, sometimes when I look at Boston Consulting Group, I feel I'm part of the majority because there are so many really smart Indian kids uh, who have excelled and, and joined the company. But when you are a minority and you stand out, you have to be really very introspective and be mm -hmm. conscious of how you are perceived and play your cards right to make sure that the true you comes out. Because if you get into a shell and don't reflect who you truly are, 
you are sub optimizing yourself so the first thing you want to feel is comfortable in your own skin and then be who you are i mean we are very warm people and very inspiring people and that is what i did it was not easy uh, but you know you want people to show that you are interested in them and especially americans are very interested in people who are interested in them <laughs> so show a genuine interest in what interests them and you'll have a way of combine of of, uh, of uh, relating to them so uh you know it's very interesting because there are those big points that you have to score right those big plays and you need to first prepare yourself for the play uh, i'm sort of a more qualified to talk about tennis than cricket now because i've been Please. not watching cricket for the last 40 years yeah. so for me before a person walks into my office i spend a couple of seconds conditioning my mind to say okay what is important to this guy how do i like him more so that i can really give him feedback to inspire him you know when you give people feedback if you don't like them you should not give them feedback find a way to like them sometimes you have to work with people you hate you know you can have team members that you really dislike but you have to find a way of that common thing that binds you together and build on that so that you can then focus now concentration starts diminishing when you get to my age so i try to do few things and write them down right so i think it's important to have your plays right i mean everything there are plays it's right this is why i think life is a process you plan do you measure you provide feedback and you improve uh you know phelps the the famous swimmer right his play is routinized so from the time he has breakfast in the morning to the time he finishes his race it's a series of steps that he has repeated over and over and over and over again so when he played uh, when he swam in the olympics there was a gog- goggle miss uh, 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 dysfunction and he lost sight of where he was going but because he had got the play so right he was able to break a world record even though he was totally blind blinded right um so it's important to have the play so that you repeat it consistently otherwise life becomes a wilderness of single instances and you can't perfect a single instance you can only perfect repetition so get the plays right get the routines right and then that's how you so you improve i mean i saw uh, uh john uh, uh 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 the tennis players right i mean they could serve they can put a dime on the serve uh, court and they would hit the dime on that serve how do they do that by serving over and over and over again right federer i'm pr- sure there are many 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 books uh, sometimes you get sort of attracted to people and just like i said the brand when someone says something uh, you know you take it more seriously than when someone else takes it i am a big fan of ram charan right ram is uh, one of the greatest strategic thinkers and at brandix we are fortunate to have his counsel uh and he has a book on almost every strategic topic in fact he has just come out with a book on digitization which is right. a hot thing today i haven't read it yet but it's about data right he has a book on talent he has a book on strategy so uh, that's one person i would i would recommend uh but i would also i'd be a miss if i don't recommend the book called mindset mm-hmm. by carol dweck uh it is a book that satya nadella a ceo of uh, microsoft requires all of its employees to read uh because he talks about your approach to life or your mindset is it a fixed mindset or is it a growth mindset and i won't go into details on that book but uh, it's really worth checking that book out uh, so let's repeat break. that um, priyan for the benefit of everyone so it's um, mindset by carol dweck yes and it's the book that every microsoft employee has read (laughs) 
Yeah, I think it's it's important. I mean, if I was to give an a- analogy, when I came to this country, I was crazy about cricket, right? In the 70s. And there was baseball. And I just hated baseball because it was not cricket, right? It was a cheap form of cricket in my opinion. And as a result, I never got into baseball. And that hurt me because when I used to take clients out for entertainment, for baseball games i was like a zombie didn't understand or didn't appreciate some of the statistics and i didn't grow up with baseball and i didn't bother to study about it so the key is if you are working in a global arena get to know your environment so that you are comfortable in it right uh and it might be things that you might hate like baseball because it's not cricket but just get an understanding of what it is even if you don't drink wine just get an understanding of yeah. the different types of wine so that you can have a conversation around it so the second thing is remember yourself and bring your uniqueness to the table i find that sri lankans and this may be unfair but they are less assertive than indians because they are more okay. conscious of themselves i wouldn't say they are more conscious they are probably a little more conscious of their consciousness of themselves if you have an idea say it and say it in a kind of way that gets attention sometimes you might have to use silence when you want to make a point have pauses breaks right if you don't have a loud voice or you are not loud like some of these new yorkers right so use your own technique to make that point across and you don't have to have volume just have quality not quantity So when you make a point it's thoughtful and that it sort of stops people on their tracks. 